All right, get ready to dive deep because today we're going right into the core of your computer, those invisible forces that make everything happen operating systems. Uh -huh. And our guidebook for this adventure is developing a multi-threaded kernel from scratch. But don't worry, we'll decode all the technical stuff for you. Yeah, it's like we're going full on digital archeologist, digging through the layers of code that make computers tick. Exactly, and we're starting right from the beginning. You hit that power button and boom, your computer springs to life. Remember those Hello World programs everyone writes when they're learning to code? Yeah. This book shows you how to make one that runs before your operating system even loads. Talk about starting from scratch. It's like going back to the bare bones. Mm. You know, like you really see what happens in those first few milliseconds. The bootloader doing its thing. The system starting in that limited real mode, like those old 8086 processors. Then bam, switching to protected mode that modern computers use. So real mode is like the horse-drawn carriage of computing. And protected <laughs> mode is like hopping into a Tesla. Uh-huh. Yeah, you could say that, but seriously, protected mode was a huge deal. At first, CPUs could only work with a tiny bit of memory, like just one of a B. Protected mode changed the game. Suddenly, you could use way more memory, run different programs without them crashing into each other, all the stuff we take for granted now. Okay, so it's like protected mode gave each program its lane on the highway instead of everyone fighting for space on a single dirt road. Exactly, that's memory protection and it's what keeps your computer from constantly crashing. And it's also what makes virtual memory possible, which is how your computer runs programs even bigger than your actual RAM. Mm. It's like a magic trick, making your computer think it has more memory than it really does. Now that's what I call clever. Mm. But how does the computer even know what to do with all that memory? We're talking gigabytes of data here. The book talks about this thing called the interrupt vector table, or IVT sounds important. Oh, it definitely is. Think of it like a giant switch port connecting all the hardware and software in your computer. When something happens, like you press a key or move the mouse, the IVT tells the processor exactly what code to run to handle it. So it's like a super organized to-do list for the computer. Exactly. That's how everything happens in the right order at the right time. Makes sense. Okay, now let's talk about storage. I've always wondered, how does a computer know where a file starts and ends on a hard drive? It's not like there are little dividers in there, right? No, no, it's much cooler than that. That's where file systems come in. They're like these super organized librarians dividing your hard drive into neat little blocks and keeping track of which blocks belong to which files. So instead of searching through a massive warehouse of data, the computer has a detailed map to find everything. Precisely. Without that organization, your computer would be total lost in a sea of ones and zeros. Makes perfect sense. Now, the book mentions something called FAT16. Is that one of these librarian systems? It is. FAT16 was one of the early file systems, and it's a great example of how data gets organized on a disk. Think of it like the Dewey Decimal System, but for your computer files. Cool. So we've got our memory sorted, our storage organized. Feels mm -hmm. like we're building a whole digital city here. But even in a city, you need places to put things. The book mentions building a heap Anything like that pile of laundry I'm ignoring at home. Not quite. <laughs> in operating systems, a heap is a special area of memory where programs can temporarily store their stuff. Mm. Imagine you're having a party and suddenly you need more chairs. Right. The heap is like having a storage room where you can grab those extra chairs and then put them back when you're done. Ah, dynamic memory allocation. Mm -hmm. Fancy way of saying it. But managing all that, especially within the limited resources of an operating system, that's got to be tough, right? It's a real juggling act, that's for sure. It's like trying to fit all those chairs back into the storage room without wasting any space. The book does a great job of explaining how to manage the heap effectively. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Okay, so we've gone over the first steps of booting up, switching to protected mode, the importance of the IVT, how data is organized with file systems, even dipped our toes into memory management with the heap? What's next on our agenda for building an operating system from the ground up? Well, now that we've laid the groundwork, we can start exploring some of the more advanced stuff, like how the OS uses memory efficiently with this technique called paging. Remember that magic trick we talked about where your computer acts like it has more RAM than it really does? Oh, yeah, I remember That's that. where paging comes in. Okay, I am totally hooked. Let's crack open this paging thing, you know? <laughs> I'm all about seeing how things really work. Okay, so last time we left off with this whole paging thing, the secret weapon operating systems use for memory, like virtual memories backstage pass, right? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Basically, paging is how your computer runs programs even bigger than your RAM. 
Like, imagine a magic filing cabinet. Okay. It swaps files between your desk and a giant storage room. So you've always got what you need right there. I'm trying to picture this magic cabinet. But how does paging actually work? Break it down for me. All right, so picture your computer's memory and a hard drive all split up into these equal-sized pieces like pages in a book, right? Okay, I'm with you. Now, when you open a program, only the pages it needs right now get loaded into RAM. The rest chill out on the hard drive. So it's like bringing just the chapters you need to study instead of the whole encyclopedia. Exactly. And if you need a different chapter, boom, the OS grabs it from the hard drive super fast. It's happening all the time behind the scenes. That's slick. Like the OS is playing high-speed Tetris with memory blocks. <laughs> But speaking of organization, the book also mentions virtual file systems, or VFS. What's the deal with those? Think of VFS as a universal translator for all the different types of file systems. Remember FAT16, our Dewey Decimal System for computers? Yeah. Well, there are others out there, each with their own way of organizing things, like different languages for information. Oh, interesting. And VFS is the interpreter so your operating system can understand and work with all of them. No matter what kind of hard drive you've got, the OS sees one big, happy file system. You got it. It hides all the complexity, makes things easier for everyone. Okay, so we've got memory tricks with paging, universal translation with VFS. It's like we're peeking behind the curtain of a well-oiled machine. But I know there's more to an OS than just managing stuff. How do we actually get to run our own programs on this thing? Now, that's where things get really cool. The book actually walks you through making a simple user land program the kind we use every day and running it within this operating system we're building hold on we're talking writing a program and running it on the os at the same time it's like baking a cake and building the oven simultaneously it's quite a process mm -hmm. but the book breaks it down step by step writing the code loading it then handing control from the kernel that's the os's heart over to your program. Okay, I gotta ask, how does a little program even talk to the all-powerful kernel? They're like from different worlds, right? You're right, there's a clear separation between user land, where our programs hang out, and kernel land, the VIP area where the core OS stuff happens. Kernel gets the best seats in the house, but seriously, why is that separation so important? Security and stability, mainly. You don't want any random program messing with the OS's core functions. That's how you get crashes. Makes sense. But if they're separate, how do they communicate at all? Like, how does a program ask the kernel for something without causing chaos? That's where this crucial thing comes in. Interrupt zero by 80. Think of it like a dedicated hotline that programs can use to make requests to the kernel. Interrupt zero by 80. Sounds serious. So it's like a request line for VIP services from the kernel. What kind of stuff can a program ask for? Well, all sorts of things. Reading a file, writing to the screen, needing more memory. Anything that needs the kernel's permission, basically. So it's like the program places an order and interrupt zero by 80 is the delivery service. Exactly. It's all about maintaining order, keeping things secure, but still letting programs get what they need. This is seriously cool stuff. It's like we're learning the secret language of computers. But how does the kernel handle all these requests coming in through interrupt zero by 80? There's got to be a system, right? Oh, you better believe it. And that's what we're going to dive into next. The book gets into the nitty gritty of building a whole system within the kernel to manage all these commands from user programs. Okay, I'm all ears. This is like a masterclass in organization OS edition. <laughs> so last time we were talking about interrupt zero by 80, that direct line between user programs and the kernel, like ordering room service from the operating system, right? But how does the kernel keep up with all those orders? It's gotta have some system, right? Oh, absolutely. Think of it like this. The kernel has a whole team of chefs in the kitchen, each one an expert at certain requests. There's a whole system for logging e-order, what it is, all the details, and which chef is handling it. Like a high-tech kitchen with digital order tickets flying around. Exactly. That's how every request gets handled quickly and in the right order. Impressive. Okay, but how does a program actually place an order with this interrupt zero by 80 thing, what does that look like in the code? It's like using a secret code for each dish on the menu. The program picks the code for what it wants, like read this file and sends it through interrupt zero by 80. The kernel team knows exactly what that code means, just like a well-trained kitchen staff. So it's all about having the right code. What if the program needs to send more info along with the request though, like the actual name of the file it wants to read? Ah, that's where things get even trickier. The book explains how the kernel can actually beak into the user program's memory to grab that extra information. 
is like the kernel sending a runner over to the user program's table to get more details about their order. Okay, now that sounds like some serious memory management. It is. The kernel has to be super careful when accessing the user program's memory. One wrong move, and you could have security issues or even crashes. It's a delicate dance between providing services and making sure everything stays stable. Exactly. The book gets into the weeds of doing this securely, so the kernel gets the info it needs without compromising the whole system. It's incredible how much thought goes into every little detail of an operating system. So we've got our ordering system figured out. We know how to send info to the kitchen. Now, how does the kernel run these programs while it's doing everything else? Yeah, it brings us to one of the coolest parts of OS design multitasking. Even though it seems like your computer is running tons of programs at once, the processor can actually only handle one thing at a time. Wait, so my computer is juggling chainsaws, but only touching one at a time? In a way, yeah. But it switches between them so fast, it creates the illusion of doing everything at once. That's where time slicing comes in. Time slicing? Sounds kind of sci-fi. It's basically a super precise timer that gives each program a tiny slice of the processor's attention before moving on to the next one. The OS is like a meticular timekeeper, making sure every program gets its fair share. So it's constantly pausing, switching, resuming all at lightning speed. Precisely. And the really cool part is that it's all happening behind the scenes. To the user, everything just looks like it's running smoothly at the same time. Mind blown. But what happens if a program acts up and doesn't want to give up its turn? Ah, that's a great question. Sometimes programs misbehave, like getting stuck in a loop or trying to access memory that's off limits. So like a kid throwing a tantrum in the middle of playtime, how does the OS deal with that? That's when the kernel has to step in and lay down the law. Mm. It can spot those misbehaving programs and knows how to deal with them without letting everything else crash. It's like having a built-in babysitter for your programs. Exactly. The kernel can pause, shut down, or even isolate the troublemaker so everything else keeps running smoothly. Wow. Operating systems really do have a tool for everything. This deep dive has been amazing. I never realized how complex and clever something I use every day really is. It's been a pleasure exploring it with you. And this is really just the beginning. Operating system design is a huge and fascinating world, and this book is a great place to start if you want to go deeper. I'm definitely adding it to my reading list. So for our listeners who are feeling inspired to explore operating systems more, what's one key takeaway they should remember from all this? Just remember, under the surface of your computer screen, there's a whole world of intricate processes working together to make your digital life possible. Well said. And on that note, We'll wrap up this incredible journey into the heart of operating systems. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep diving deep into the world of tech.